Hello, welcome back to Chapter 6 of the Gita Decoded. We're looking at the Bhagavad Gita, specifically the Yoga of Meditation. Sister Denise has taken us through Shlokas 1 to 9 and we are now on Shloka number 10. Sister Denise, thank you so much for joining us today and very warm welcome. Thank you. I notice that there are a number of titles, uh, qualities that depict um, being alone. The words that are used are self-reliance, self-dependence and specifically in Shloka 10 the word that is used is remaining in solitude and not only that but what to do when you're alone, not just being alone. The yogin should concentrate constantly on the self, capital S, remaining in solitude alone with controlled mind and body having no desires and destitute of possessions. How do you understand this? And Sister Denise, I'd like you to explain this shloka in light of a person who chooses to lead a, well, I hate to use the word normal life, but um, let me give you a practical example. This person um, has a family and he goes to work every day, um, comes back, has to fulfill his responsibilities at work and his family and his friends and has hobbies on the side. So how does he integrate this practice into that? This is the normal circumstances for most of us. Mm. And even if you have somebody who is in an ashram, you know, there's still a dimension of normal life that's still going on. So I think it's all to do with your inner space. Very much recommended which we do in Brahma Kumaris is to suggest to people include a good space in your place where you live for meditation. Some people they keep a chair on the balcony of their flat, some people they have a space in their bedroom which they keep for meditation. The reason is that when you meditate regularly in a particular place which is just you by yourself, um, that little area takes on the atmosphere and vibration of meditation, which is going to help you when you come there again for further meditation. So this on the external level. And you'll see also in this chapter of the Gita, there's a whole thing about how you set up your meditation space. And people really like it when they have a very specific meditation place. It can be quite elaborate, but doesn't have to be. You know, it can be just, you go for a walk regularly somewhere and you have a spot in the park or on the beach or wherever you go for your walk that you regularly sit for your meditation. Solitude is um, not just only you're physically by yourself, we use the word in Hindi, ekant, and ekant uh, has a lot of meaning. Ekant also means that you have understood the full meaning of the one. Why are you in solitude is because when you're by yourself, you're with God very easily. You don't have to be with God, but to be by yourself is a precursor to being with God because when you're by yourself you can move yourself away from the world of people, the world of things, the world of matter and go for the world of the spirit. So there's that aspect. And in solitude you start thinking about things that you don't think about when you're engaged with people and duties and whatnot. So I think the important thing here is to have many dimensions and layers to your life. So time out for yourself actually brings you into balance. If you're a yogi, somebody who's into spirituality, you're generating a lot of energy. And so when you're with people, you tend to share that energy. And then you also need your solitary time for you to replenish that. So there's a, a flow going on. The, the focus in the shloka is a 
um, not just solitude, but how one focuses on God. This involves a level of internal and external discipline. And the discipline of being a yogi or yogin, as described in this chapter, is taken up throughout chapter 6. Um, what measure of external discipline is required and what measure of internal discipline is required? There is uh, something to be said for the external discipline. You know, if you keep your space uncluttered, it gives you space to think. You're not pulled by this and that things. If you keep your time such that you don't have to rush to meditate, you know, that you, you, you've disciplined your use of time in the day, you discipline your space, you discipline your meetings and all of that so that you really gaining time. A lot of people say, I don't have time for meditation. We don't have time for meditation because we don't discipline our use of time. So time to meditate has to be sort of uh, extracted from the day, carved out, and this is something that you give value to. There is a, a very important relationship between the inner and the outer and they reflect each other. So a person who gives good time to the inner and has the inner in a very organized way, their outer will reflect that too. Sister Denise, I would like to now take you to verse 14, which reads, with quieted mind-banishing fear established in the Brahmacharan vow of celibacy, controlling the mind with thoughts fixed on me, he should sit concentrated, devoted to me. Now the word that uh, leaps out, out of the page and grabs one's attention is the C word. <laughs> there have been people who have practiced this uh, throughout time, uh, not just in Hinduism but in other religions as well. Uh, how does one link a Brahmacharya and vow of celibacy to the rest of the practices enunciated in not just this chapter but throughout the Bhagavad Gita? Where does it fit into the picture? And my second question, writing on that, is uh, in order to be spiritual and to fulfill the what is expected of you within the Bhagavad Gita? Do you have to be celibate? Can you not lead a family life? I think it's very interesting that here it's very specifically stated that if you want to be really successful in your meditation, you will decide for yourself that you will renounce your sexuality because it's connected with the whole question of passion and uh, passion is the fire which leaps all over the place and uh, the the meditator is like a flame which is not moving hmm, so very know. powerful image and very rare to be able to achieve that, obviously, isn't it? Sure. Because uh, the average flame uh, does this. Yes. Yeah. And as soon as you get into passion, mm. then you have a conflagration, mm. you know. So what we see here is that if a person really wants to take their spiritual practice to the highest level, celibacy comes into it. And you will see in different religions, the monks and nuns, the sannyasis, you know, people who really want uh, their spiritual practice to be the central part of their lives, they will um, de decide to practice celibacy. Then you have to deal with all of that energy physically, emotionally, psychologically, and every which way, because in a way it's part of solitude. When you're sexually active, you're with someone. And when you're married, you're with someone, you have your children, you're engaged in the whole family. But there's a lot of people who maybe start their families, get their children grown up and so on, and then they may decide at a later time to be celibate. 
Uh, there are a few people who are inspired to remain celibate and they remain virgins for their whole life. And so you just have to really kind of understand yourself and see what kind of person you are. And if you think that from a young age you want to do this, then okay, that's very good. Or you may start like this and then move into family and then return to celibacy. There's that format as well. I mean, you do however it seems to be the right thing. And celibacy has to be a choice, uh, almost like a vocation. Celibacy isn't just abstinence or renunciation of the pleasures of the flesh. Celibacy is a very, very refined type of state of being where, you know, you're really progressively moving yourself away from the body and you're actually shifting your body because the body can be refined even on the cellular level, you know, and, and uh, when, you, when you're in a, a spiritual practice very intensively, it is going to shift you physically as well. In you what way? You become highly sensitive, especially highly sensitive to vibration. Each person has their own vibration. So even if you touch another person, you'll get some sort of electric shock because your energy and their energy don't necessarily match. And this is also connected with the idea of detachment. If you want to take it to that level, you want to really go into your solitude. But I don't think it's useful to just avoid everybody or try and avoid the natural realities of your physical body and your sexual urges and so on. You have to work with them. You have to work through them. You have to decide what do you want? Okay, I want to now go to verses 16 and 17 where a balanced lifestyle is advocated mm -hmm. and the last line of verse 17 is a very attractive one. Uh, for him who is uh, moderate in food and diversion, whose actions are disciplined, who's moderate in sleep and waking and there's other moderations mentioned in uh, verse 16. It is said that yoga destroys all sorrow. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it's it's a wow. Okay, and I think um, this is a um, the sweetness of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Every now and again, you see one of these lines that think, uh, "I want this." Yet, if you look at the number of people who read the Bhagavad Gita, a large percentage of them have lives that have a lot of sorrow in it. And um, I'm not even mentioning the people who don't read the Bhagavad Gita. So I'd like you to discuss moderation with us and this line. It's connected with renunciation. You know, in Brahma Kumaris, the way we practice it is like this. There's a kind of a standard of lifestyle in terms of, you know, your room, your office, your kitchen, your classroom. It has to be comfortable, but not something you are going to just sink into and fall asleep in. Um, but it doesn't have to be austere. Do you see what I mean? We are always taught everything should be middle. Don't have too much money, don't have too little. Um, don't have too many clothes, don't have insufficient. It's all about trying to get the right thing. Amongst all of us, we tend to go for that intuitively because it somehow is connected with the yoga. You have to understand what you need in order to accomplish your duties. I believe in having good tools, scissors that don't cut is a waste of time, a True. computer that doesn't work is no good, yes. a car that you have to keep fixing is no good. You don't have to go luxury, but you also don't have to give yourself trouble because your time is valuable. The things around you need to be uh, practical, efficient, uh, so that you don't have to think about it. And so we lead uh, what we call a life of simplicity, but not austerity. Mm, that's a very powerful distinction because, Sister Denise, a lot of people reading these chapters think, 
uh, I can't be attached to my family. I cannot um, be attached to things. I have to be celibate. Oh my goodness, this is deprivation, a life of deprivation. No, no, it's not. Uh, and also, I think we need to qualify the word attachment because I think it can be misleading. You know, we tend to use the word attached to mean I like or I love. But actually, attached means I'm unable to survive without. So unable absolutely so. enmeshed and dependent. That is where it becomes a vice. Okay, enmeshed. That's um, I, I like that because you know, an image comes to mind as a fish caught up in a net and trying to we wiggle its way out of it. And the more it wiggles, it's more entrapped it becomes. That's right. Okay, and That's eventually right. it dies. Or if you put your fingers together, you don't know who's who, mm. you see. Mm. So it's very important to differentiate I'm me and you're you. And we have a relationship, which is not a dependent relationship, but a relationship that's constantly being renegotiated, that is harmonious, that works, you know, and as and when it stops working is renegotiated. But you never lose yourself. You know, in, in some um, people's thinking, y you talk of your, your uh, spouse as your other half, as if you're only half a person and that the couple is one thing. You know, actually a couple is two people who interact and in, in a certain way that they have negotiated uh, so that there can be the full sustenance of a family, you see. A couple is not two half people becoming one couple. No, that's that's an enmeshment, that's mm. a dependency. So, so Denise, uh, now we're on the subject of attachment. This is what people want. They want somebody that you can love completely, depend on completely, trust completely. Uh, somebody, I once heard it said that um, love means that this person is home for me, home. Th that involves um, a large degree of attachment because um, if the person is not there, you feel lost. Well, you see, if you feel lost, if the person is not there, there's something wrong. Yeah, but I'm saying this is what people want. It releases oxytocin and it makes you feel good and you're, this is what we want. Then we we want drug. our attachments. Then it's operating like a drug. Okay. And so the Gita says, don't go there? The Gita says, you, who you are is complete within yourself and your um, source should not be taken from people. You see, what, what happens very often is you say, I love this person. You can see it especially in the Spanish language, yo te quiero, which means I want you. I am going to consume your energy and call that love. That's not love, that's predatory. There are lots of predators out there, Sister Denise, with, with willing victims. So this is the problem, the victim-predator situation rather than um, two people who come together, but they never lose their integrity, they never lose their individuality. A victim predator, somebody's consuming and somebody's getting consumed, is going to build up a lot of resentment. That's not going to be a happy combination. It may be attractive for a few minutes, oh, well, let me plunge myself into this fire and burn, but then you just end up as ashes. That's quite a... Um descriptive <laughs> state. Okay, Sister Denise, the 18th verse reads as follows, when he is absorbed in self alone with controlled mind, free from longing, from all desires, then he is said to be a saint. When I read this, it struck me that somebody who reads this thinks, okay, if you want to be a saint, this is what you do. But if you want to be an ordinary person like me, then uh, I'm going to skip this chapter and move on to something that I like. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Okay, because the standards are incredibly high, but then you realize that only somebody who wants to be a sage or a saint aspires to this, and this is not for um, 
the ordinary person. So what would you say to this? Is there a saint in all of us? Again, I would go back to this question, what do you want? You know, if you want to be a saint, well, this is what you do. If you want to be an ordinary person and doing all the worldly things, but you find yourself reading the Gita, uh, does that inspire something in you to add a dimension of spirituality to your regular life? If so, you know, you have to see what you want to do and which bits of the Gita, I mean, for example, be your own best friend, not your own worst enemy. What's wrong with that? Yeah, what's you wrong know? with that? So there are plenty of elements in the Gita which somebody who is leading a, a life which is very engaged in the world, they will say, yeah, this is going to add a, a good dimension to my life. And everybody's life changes time to time. And every so often something happens when you say, you know what, I really need the spiritual component to help me deal with this situation. I, I, I remember when um, one of my family members' spouse became very, very dangerously ill. Um, the first thing the family member did was to call me and say, you know, I need you at this time because this is a sort of spiritual critical moment. So um, if there wasn't somebody in our family who gives a lot of attention to the spiritual part, they'd have to look elsewhere, you see. But because I was there, the first thought was, okay, let's, let's talk to her because she knows this stuff. Sister Denise, I now want to go on to verse 21, which reads, He knows that infinite happiness, which is grasped by the intellect and transcends the sentence, and established there, does not deviate from the truth. Tell us about happiness, which transcends the senses. That is uh, very interesting to me, because if I look at the way, well, I function and most other people function, um, 19, all of your experiences come from the body. What this implies is that you can have experiences that do not involve your physical body. Yes. This is news to a lot of readers. And I think, Sister Denise, with respect, a lot of people read it, but just don't get it. Well, look at your mind. Um, your mind is one of the faculties of the soul, which means that your mind itself is non-physical. And all experiences that you have through your body are experienced in your mind, which is not part of your body. So that means already there is the body and not the body, because the body cannot have an experience. The mind experiences. So the mind is really locked into the body, the sense uh, organs, and the object of sense perception. But at the same time, the mind is perfectly capable of um, sensing something which is non-physical. One thing that is very interesting, one of the ways that you experience happiness is when you understand something that you didn't understand before. That really brings you a feeling of happiness. There's nothing to do with a sense perception. It's in your intellect, it's in your um, understanding. Then when you are uh, having an interaction with discarnate God, God who is without a body, you can only do that by detaching from your body at the level of the mind and focusing your mind on that one. There you can experience in the mind directly, you can experience the love of God, the peace of God. That is not a sensory experience. That's beyond the senses. So this is what this uh, shloka is talking about. Uh, as I hear you speak about um, God and your relationship with him, I think we should do an entire episode on that subject alone because it's um, 
every time you speak about it, it's just a taste. And I'd like the viewers to know fully what you mean by engaging with God um, in an asensorial manner, uh, just using the mind. But um, we will postpone that for another day because we have run out of time right now. So there you have it. Sister Denise has taken us through uh, what is meant by solitude, what is meant by going beyond the senses and emanating experiences from within the self that have got nothing to do with the body. Mm, she's described uh, what non-attachment means in respect of relationships. So this particular episode to me was extremely educational and I hope you feel the same at home. And um, like with everything that's shared here, this is not a theory. The Bhagavad Gita was never meant to be theory. How are you practicing this? This is the question. How are you using it to improve the quality of your life? So thank you, Sister Denise, for joining us. And thank you at home for joining us. And um, I hope that you took at least one aspect from today's episode that you could use in your life to make yourself a better person. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you soon for the continuation of the Yoga of Meditation of Chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita. Goodbye.